At this point, you've discovered how to find the derivative of a function using the limit definition of a derivative. Importantly, if you've done this with very many polynomials, especially of higher degrees, you realize this is an extremely difficult and time-consuming task. For example, this is the definition of the derivative of this polynomial function right here. And if you have any experience with this, this becomes extremely time consuming and difficult because you have to expand, especially these terms right here that have this binomial raised to the second or the third power. And if we're in the business of finding derivative functions, which we are, it behooves us, instead of doing the whole limit definition of a derivative every single time, to develop some rules for the basic parts of polynomials. The two basic structures that make up polynomials are first, constants. These also will be coefficients, but specifically constant terms. And the second is the piece that makes this or defines this as a polynomial. It's x to the n, where n is a positive integer. The first of these is extremely easy. I'm not going to show a, a rigorous proof, but the idea being the derivative or the rate of change of a constant function, a function that outputs the same thing for every x value, the rate of change is zero. The rest of this video will be dedicated to showing you the rule for attacking the general form of x to the n, again, where n is a positive integer. First up is the binomial theorem. The binomial theorem is something that maybe you've seen previously. It's a formula for expanding binomials of this type, x plus y raised to the nth power, where n is a positive integer. The binomial theorem tells us that when you expand this expression right here, it will be defined by this summation. I'm not going to spend the time right now detailing all this notation, but just so you know, this is a summation. This creates a series of terms that are defined by this part right here. K will start at zero and go to N. N is a fixed number in this formula. It's the exponent that you have right here. It could be a three, it could be a five, it could be a 10. This is the coefficient of the term. This is a choose statement. You maybe have seen this in the previous discussions of probability or combinations of permutations. This is N choose K. I'll define that in half a second. And these are the X, Y factors. And this how it describes their exponents. For the purpose of the proof, there's a little bit of reason to dig into this choose statement, and I'll show you that in one second. But in this case right here, n choose k is the formula n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. This might seem like a kind of a complicated statement, but if you've ever worked with these, you know they're actually fairly simple, simple to work with and simplify. The factorials are just these lists of multiplications in descending order, right? There's a lot of canceling when you're dividing them from each other. The most important thing that we care about for this conversation are the, the two statements that happen on the ends of our, our expansions. Specifically, there are four of these choose statements that I want to look at very quickly. And I won't prove them, but it's very easy to verify. n choose 0 and n choose n both equal 1. In fact, when you plug these statements in here, again, where k is either 0 or k is n, they become equivalent statements. Either way, these are equal to 1. Second thing to say is that if you have n choose 1 or n choose n minus one, so this is one less than this right here. If you plug either of those statements into the original problem, you'll always output the value n. There's a chance this is feeling all really abstract at this point. Let me ground this with a very specific example. Let's expand x plus y to the fourth power. So my first step was simply replacing the n's in this expression with four. This will now produce five different terms, starting with the k value of zero being plugged through for the first term, then going to one, then to two, then to three, and then to four. It will produce a string of terms where this choose statement will be the coefficients, and these, the exponents will be determined by the k value. Here are explicitly the five terms generated by this summation right here. And again, don't get caught too much in the weeds here, though I want to very strictly justify what I'm about to say. Importantly here are these statements here, the coefficients 
at this point and this point. Those are both going to be one based on this statement right here. So four over zero or four over four, both equal one. And then importantly, this second term and the next to last term, this is four over one, and this is four over three, or four over four minus one. Those coefficients are going to end up being four, that main number. So when I simplify this, this will look like one x to the fourth plus four x cubed y plus, by the way, four choose two, I know is six x squared y squared. And then this is four x y cubed plus one y to the fourth. A couple really important features about this ex binomial expansion right here. First and foremost is that every term has an X and Y in it, except for these last terms right here. And as you progress from left to right, we lose a number of X's and gain a number of Y's. Second are the coefficients that we have on the ends. On the ends, we have a coefficient of one. When we take one step in, the next coefficient is the end value that we had as this exponent right here. Every single time, that will result in the coefficient of that term. All right, all of that was just justification for what I'm about to do. Now what I'm going to do is take the derivative of the general form of x to the n, where n is a positive integer. All right, now for the fun. If we define our function to be x to the n, where again, n is this positive integer, then we know by definition the derivative function of f will be defined by the limit as h goes to zero of x plus h to the n minus x to the n all over h. Now you're gonna see it and probably realize why we just had that conversation about binomial expansion. It's to deal with this term right here. And we actually don't need to know the, all the details about every term when we do this, but we can generalize that expansion and you'll see the interaction with these other components of the limit definition. So the fun part is now expanding this. I'm gonna expand the first three terms and the last couple terms of this general expression. Again, I don't know what my end value, but the general expansion would look like this according to the binomial theorem. I'll have x to the n plus n x to the n minus one h to the one. Now again, this n right here was my explanation from previously, like the example of x plus y to the fourth that ended up being a four coefficient. This coefficient will always be the same as that exponent right there. That's critically important to this proof. And then my next one will be some constant. I won't write the choose statement. I'll just say constant one. This is x uh, to the n minus two now, and we have an h squared. A lot more terms, right, where I'm decreasing the exponent of the x's, increasing the h's, until I get to the last couple where I have an n x h to the n minus 1, and my last term is h to the n. So all of this right here is a general expansion of this component right there. I then have this minus x to the n that comes from this piece, and I'm still all over h. <sighs> okay, let's take one quick step back again and just say, what the heck are we doing? Remember, whenever we're trying to simplify these derivative statements where the limit where h goes to zero, our denominator by default will go to zero. We have to take care of that because we can't directly substitute h as zero until we've gotten rid of the division of zero. But check this out, and this is awesome. First and foremost, this minus x to the n that comes from this term right here will cancel with this first term of x to the n right here. Importantly, because of that move right there, I'm now left with an expression in the numerator where every single term is now definitely has at least one factor of h that I can cancel with this right here. Let me write this out one more time so I can explicitly do this. Since the only term that didn't have an h is canceled, I can now cancel a factor of h in the denominator 
with one H in each of these terms. And watch what happens with the first term here. Since this only had one H to give, I now have no H's in that term. Every other term will have more than just one H. And so we'll cancel those. After I cancel the H in the denominator with one H in each of the terms, I'm left with N times X to the N minus one in my first term, plus some constant times X to the N minus two H, plus a bunch of other terms that would have H's in them until I get N X to the H to the N minus two, plus H to the N minus one. And I'm no longer divided by H because it got canceled in that last step. Now I have no issue with dividing by zero. I can plug in H equals zero into each of these terms and all of these terms that now have H's in them all go to zero, leaving me with this term surviving. Giving me a final answer of the derivative of X to the N equals N X to the N minus one. While your head might be spinning a little bit from the complexity of this problem right here, the important thing is this. We have rigorously defended and proved that the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. Part of you might be thinking, why would we go through all that work? Well, the answer is this trick right here unlocks the derivative to any polynomial function. And we will no longer need to use the limit definition because we generally use the limit definition for this rule right here. And you'll see very shortly this, along with a few other very simple rules for derivatives, will allow us to attack any polynomial function and find the derivative in seconds.